शोर यू विल हैव क्वेरीज क्वेश्चन कमेंट्स मे आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द स्पीकर टू कम ऑन द डायस एंड फेस द कॉन्सिक्वेंसिस सो वॉट वी विल डू इज आई रियलाइज दैट वी आर रनिंग लिटल बिहाइंड शेड्यूल बट इन द इंटरेस्ट ऑफ साइंस यू ऑल नो दैट वी हैव टू सेक्रीफाइस समथिंग वील सेक्रीफाइस हाफ एन आवर ऑफ अवर टाइम for taking question answer so we will close this discussion at 1:30 uh, what uh, and then we will have 45 minutes of lunch and then come back for the next session so that's the schedule i have chalked out for you and i think you will bear with this delay but the talks have been so fascinating and so informative i thought we could uh, scoop some time out of our lunch schedule so what i'll do is i'll just be a spectator to uh, see if there are hands going up for comments and questions rohini yes i'll come to you uh, please be brief in your comments and please be brief in your answers so that we can go for lunch so rohini i had a very brief comment because of uh, Uh, shomak who suggested they named avsarala technologies so what i wanted to say is one of the big things things that happens at a ground level is if the participation in mega projects brings up and re- re- nurtures very small scale industry or middle small scale industry and one of the example is this avsarala technologies because they are now making these systems for you uh, and they have actually made what are called precision positioning magnet systems 2400 in number on which lhc resides essentially to make sure that the beam propagates very accurately so what i'm trying to say is that this is a investment at very different levels at many many different levels the same way the some of the early particle physics projects had very big interactions with something called, you know uh, with uh, bharat electronics uh, and you know bharat semiconductors where they makes very important investments and which now they are using for their own purposes later on so this is one very specific fallout of mega projects that really comes and yes. the cr- cross talk between a old application in high energy physics going on further to make contributions yes, to the yes uh, really very well taken you have amplified what uh, sunil said as the benefits and it's really appreciated another Uh, yes shashi so uh, this is to uh, dr padve uh, you know having listened to the physics talks which is now mega projects going on for last 20 years so they already set up a machinery to educate people change the way they do research and educate students so considering the kind of work that you need to you know uh, the quality control you know you had to set up what is the effort in terms of education and training people uh, so the national cancer grid for quality control Uh, has uh, peer reviewed these 124 institutions it has begun the peer process of peer review so that we bring it to the level that uh, optimum level wherein everybody delivers the same kind of uh, it will take a little longer time because on an average in a year we are not able to peer review more than 8 or 10 institutions so we will try and put that up so that the qa qc at each individual institution remains uh, good and we have also put up some evidence based protocols accessible to everyone to understand how best the best of the care can be delivered and variation from them need would need justification the third component is that for anybody sitting anywhere in a uh, globally has an access to a program called navya and navya allows any raw data of a patient being put in what are the options evidence based being given within 24 hours so if somebody is at some remote place whether the treatment given fits into the best three pro- first three protocols is what we do as far as education is concerned there are two kinds of activities one is general education for public to be aware so that they can think of common cancers from the point of view of prevention as well as early detection and the second bit uh, of cancer we have uh, in all centers that we run we have uh, increased the annual take of students by more than 300% in 
in the last five years, we had the capacity to train so many. Um, and we anticipate that in coming about eight years or so, we will have adequate national resource as far as human resources is concerned. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I have uh, also some query with Dr. Wardway. Uh, your talk was very, very interesting, and uh, you did mention about the environmental factors and the genetic factors. Uh, with my background in toxicology, uh, we had shown some evidence that argimone mixing with the mustard oil and some of the other chemicals do raise the gallbladder cancer. I want to raise this flag of the environmental health, which is not getting much attention, because many of the cancers, etiology, one or two chemicals are also associated with the prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, these have come to forward. Now, when you're making or looking at these databases, and then also, as I mentioned, that it is the gene which loads the gun and environment triggers it, again, this is a very, very important aspect. Are you looking at it, or is there some data coming on that? Unless there is an a priori hypothesis, where we know that there is some kind of correlation, and we are looking at uh, the contaminants in uh, mustard oil, since that picked up as one of the uh, important etiological factors for gallbladder cancer. But uh, I, must, I must also say that statistically, between raw fish eating or fish, freshwater fish eating and use of mustard oil, are so strongly correlated with each other that whole of that region uses in every dish mustard oil and we're trying to se segregate those. Yes. You said surgical intervention generally, recurrence is very high. Does surgery act as a stimulus? Uh, without surgery, uh, let, me, let me point out, I'm a surgeon, so big conflict of interest. Uh, <laughs> without surgery, there are no documented cures in solid tumors. Let me put that as a, an, the bottom line. What we're trying to say is that our failures, which are about 30%, 40%, are those failures triggered at the time of surgery or prior to surgery? That's the question that we are trying to answer. The reason is very simple, that if it happens at the time of surgery, I can tweak something just before surgery, put the tumor to sleep, the way we put patients to sleep before surgery. Exactly similarly, can I put some, the tumor to sleep so that it doesn't react to the uh, assault that is happening onto the tumor. Japanese take a lot of raw fishes. Do they have gallbladder cancer? Raw sea fish, sea water fish, salt water fish is not an etiology. Let me give you uh, one small quick answer. The etiology that we are looking at is a, is a parasite called liver fluke. Liver fluke, for liver fluke, the intermediate host is fresh water fish or a snail. It is not sea water fish. And Dr. Badre, I'm Dr. Tucker. Uh, any relationship with the nutritional aspects, heavy metal toxicity, like uh, uh, toxicity of uh, arsenic, selenium, and also deficiency of uh, selenium has been quoted related to the cancer. I'm an agriculturist because in Sweden and uh, uh, in Scandinavian country, there's a deficiency of selenium resulting to the so uh, I have cases. a small request as a novice. Let's focus our discussion not on cancer per se and it's this thing, but the theme of the session is the mega projects uh, uh, science. Yeah, my, so what I request... My, my, my objective was that is it an included no, 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 in the mega question project? question is extremely nice, very interesting. In the interest of the session, I'll request you handle it offline. Sure at lunchtime. <laughs> so please ask questions which have implications on this mega science policy, mega science approach, all those which the panelists would be happy. To, but there are subject questions, I'm sure, ex equally exciting. We'll take them offline. So anything to do with mega science? Uh, yep. Uh, so my question is mainly to Dr. Shomak and uh, Dr. Mukhi. Uh, so I am a very uh, young scientist just entering into the field and uh, with all these mega projects happening, I wanted to ask in what way can students contribute uh, nicely. So for example, Mr. Mukhi mentioned that uh, the percolation of uh, awareness among students is still very less. And me coming mainly from an engineering institute, uh, I am from BITS Hyderabad, uh, it's very... Uh, 
although the students are really really interested if the opportunity falls into their lap or if it is there but it doesn't Im get implemented yeah so I, I actually i don't think i said percolation of information to students is very less as such i think students actually have excellent opportunities to find out about mega projects because everything's up on the internet but you know what happens is in a given institution you want some faculty there who will guide you towards that and this, this is why i have recommended that all you know all physics departments for example should have some faculty who can guide students towards mega projects be they in high energy physics or in uh, or in astrophysics yeah. uh, i think one of the things that i wanted to emphasize in my talk was that even though the three um, projects i talked about talk about really fundamental physics problems that we need to solve in the, uh, with them the challenges in building them in the next 10 years are all engineering you know, you don't need to be a gravitational wave scientist to build LIGO. So, th and, and that is why this outreach is so important. And the outreach to particularly the engineering colleges and, and communities who don't participate traditionally in, in the building process of these mega science. This is a new way of doing science in India. And it has to reach outside the core pure science community as well as as far down as possible. We are talking of things that will be finished building in 2030, 31, 32. I'm not going to be there. Nobody, I mean, most of the people in here Correct. are not going to actually <laughs> use these instruments. You will. So this, this, the, all these projects are for you. Okay. This is a question to Partho. I mean, this was a very interesting talk. When you do the genetic analysis, genomic analysis and so on, do you also take into consideration the social uh, backgrounds and the cross uh, communication that may happen when our Sociologists also involved in this, people who have been looking at the history of each tribe and so on. Then you see, when you take the total thing together, it will really become uh, very meaningful. So at two stages, we involved other uh, scientists of other disciplines at the study design stage because we can't figure out what is an ethnic group and we need to co co collaborate with uh, sociologists and anthropologists. Second, after having collected the data and analyzed the data at the stage of interpretation. So those are the two stages where multidisciplinary scientists are involved. But uh, during the actual phase of generating the data and analyzing the data, it's primarily genome scientists and statisticians. So my question was, uh, is the engineering technology available in the country? How much of it has to be sort of invented? How much of it has to be imported in, in the country to implement these mega projects? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. the, if, if it's the question is for me, I mean, in the, in, the, in the three projects I talked about, we are slowly discovering what is available in the country and what is not. And we uh, believe that most of the things that are needed are available in this country. The, the problem is that our engineering communities in general do not engage in this kind of research. Uh, and uh, their research, uh, in, even in the IITs, are uh, not dominated by uh, the technology that we need for this kind of research. And what we are discovering very rapidly is that many of these groups, even in the IITs and in the private universities as well as universities, are willing to um, diversify into this kind of research. I think most of it's available. It's a question of getting people interested in participating in, because now big money is also involved in this kind of stuff. I don't know whether Sunil wants to say something. Just, just to add one thing, you know, engineering for a science goal uh, is best done when there's an absolute emergency and it just has to be done tomorrow. So if you look at mid 20th century United States, they just needed engineering done for their nuclear program and various other programs. If you look at early 20th century during the war, Europe, okay, they needed everything tomorrow and it was done. So, you know, if it's not done in India, it will be done for these projects. Uh, uh, my question is uh, directed to any one of the four speakers. Uh, a study by Thomas Schott many years ago, uh, looking at uh, uh, publications uh, for the pub uh, to study international collaboration, revealed that in India's case, the collaboration, the density of collaboration between India and the West, and uh, institutions in India and institutions in the West, was higher than the density of collaboration between institutions in India itself. Now, in this phase of mega science, are we going to see a transformation of that collaboration one? And my second question is, is there going to be any spillover into the university system or will it remain within the... It came out very clearly that whatever you are saying is happening already 
uh, I don't know if the statistics has the data in the last two, three, five years, but from all the four talks, it was obvious that enormous inter-India uh, collaboration is, to me, it's booming. Uh, which was very clear. I think it has to. There is absolutely no manpower in the institutes who do research. I mean, the kind of manpower we're talking about um, it only exists in universities, an absolute necessity, and this is what we are doing now. Yeah, I'll this and then uh, in the middle, yeah. This is a question to Dr. Badwe and Dr. Majumdar. Today we talk about personalized medicine, which in the context of genomic medicine. So how do you actually connect the mega science big numbers, big data, with personalized medicine concept? Personalized medicine sells well. It sells well even to charities in the West. But I mentioned right at the beginning that the actual benefits of the most, the best targeted therapy is not more than 1.2 to 2%. So it hasn't made a big difference. We need to take it that if I have if I have a good hypothesis, then I have, I have to use the tool appropriately to get the data to either support or refute that hypothesis, rather than saying that I will use that uh, machinery to, to tell me an answer without asking a question. I don't think personalized medicine is going to come based on that. So I, I have a completely different take on this uh, because uh, I think that uh, the evidence, whatever, even if it has 1.5% impact on patient lives, this evidence could not have come unless large numbers were screened, bi um, um, biological pathways were screened, and therefore inhibitors were found. So I believe that a lot of it has come from mega projects, and I think it's going to contribute in a major way to all, uh, in all kinds of diseases. I had some comment on Shomax and Sunil. Uh, from my own experience being associated with this Square Kilometer Array project and some uh, concerned with the TMT, there are two worries. One is what people asked about engineering aspects of it. I was associated for six years with the engineering evaluation of the Square Kilometer Array project. Now, the amount of problems that are there in these mega projects we completely underestimate the times which are required. So now this square kilometer array project has been shifted to, the goalpost has been shifted to about 2024. When I started, it was at 2015. And now it is 2024, and I think it will end up as 2029. So you are quite right that most of us will not see this at all. But the concern is you need a lot of young talent to come in and they have to work for it, perhaps they will not also see the end result of this. So to keep the motivation for this, for yeah. this law think, yeah. is the problem. I think it's an absolutely valid point, and I really don't have a, a major response to it, except to say that if these things need to happen, as Sunil pointed out, an emergency needs to be declared. I mean, this is part of you know, the whole point of interactions like this, but also outreach to the community. It is not true that people are not coming up to do this. Now, slowly we are seeing, even in small companies like Afsarel, as Rohini said, they have realized that really they need to do things at the international standard and not, yes. and, and so the standards need to be Im improved. And this is what was holding us back in yes. the last few years, as you're yes. you telling me. I think uh, what I'll do is, before I close, since these mega projects have impact on the young people, are there any young people who have a question? Because I'll give preference to them, this and last day. My question is uh, regarding data that was being discussed uh, in talks. Uh, with a lot of data available in uh, a lot of sciences, uh, and data analytics skills being acquired by people from various fields, uh, sometimes different from where the data is coming from, uh, there are two questions, which are mostly yes or no, uh, if possible. Uh, are there interests in fields like uh, genomics and cancer research to acquire people who have data analytics skills from other fields? And second, uh, is this data or any part of the data, is the plan to have it publicly available, some part of it, so that okay. people who have data analytics skills can yeah. mine, mine it? So we are trying to embrace such people, but we don't find anybody to embrace. That's one major problem. 
the computational biol the computational people and the statisticians they would don't want to deal with biology so we don't fi find people to embrace but we are ready to embrace the second is that much of these data on mega projects especially in the area of cancer and several other diseases are, are actually in the public domain yeah I, I agree with that and in our own institution if there is any genomic project that happens the PI is given a time duration of 18 months to two years for all the publications to come out of it and then get the data in public domain. And we badly need individuals uh, who can crunch this kind of a data since everybody is learning. The is, uh, since uh, this involves a lot of money, as you all pointed out, uh, and uh, suppose, uh, how about the continuity of this policy? Like if the, means then it needs like 15 or 20 years spans so will it be like uh, if some government changes or something, the policy completely changes and whatever has been invested, uh, just uh, the policy changes and that is stopped somewhere or? Actually, I don't know who will answer this, but the uh, answer is that most of these things continue, but with some aberration and they get self-corrected. And fortunately, nobody is immortal. So everything works out <laughs> all right in the end, but <laughs> some delays are there. And this is not true for India alone. It is true across the world. And you know the example in US what's happening. I'm not sure that it will be stopped there forever. It will also change there. So fortunately, time is a healing factor and it works out well. That's it. Thank you very much. Which works out in the end all right. So I think I have now the pleasant job of saying thank you to all the speakers. At the same time, apologies to some of you who could not ask their questions. But it is always good to end on a note which is unsatisfactory, which means you still have a lot of questions and still to get answered. So I am sure uh, this has been a very exciting session for you. It has been for me, a lot of learning things. And I am sure uh, we will have uh, many things happening in future as we go along. So please join me in thanking all the speakers.